Hello everyone. This is the this is request the Turkish century from Hittites. <laughs> I'm a kid to that other one which I've already heard before, but I'm not going to say it because it's racially insensitive when I can't pronounce it. So I was going to do 15 minutes. I did 20 because I was trying to get to chapter two to end. It didn't end, and so I stopped at 20. I'm not going to do that again nipples them one would stand out and do something that no turkic tribe had done before the tatars were turkic peoples originating in central asia and one of their tribes during the expansion of the gökturk empire and its collapse settled at the aral sea expanded south into modern day turkmenistan and uzbekistan where they gave up being nomads and converted to islam the seljuks they became great admirers of their new neighbors the samanid empire of iran it was the samanids who converted the seljuks to islam the seljuks became increasingly fond of their new iranian neighbors they started dressing like their iranian idols seljuk nobility started speaking persian they adopted the persian alphabet minted persian coins built castles in persian style copied the samanids wherever they could and even formed a military alliance with them then the Samanids were overthrown by the Ghaznavids, which the Seljuks disapproved of, especially after the Ghaznavids tried to conquer them. So the Seljuks conquered them right back. And that became a watershed moment. Suddenly, they were the rulers of Persia. They, who had started as nomadic herders a few hundred years before, now were the inheritors and the heirs to the great legacy of Iran and all that came with it. Through this, their culture and the way they saw themselves radically changed, and with that, Turkic culture itself changed dramatically. At the time, the Seljuks were probably in the minority amongst the Turkic peoples, as having given up nomadic life and converted to Islam and becoming a settled people. But over the centuries, their influence through their empire would spread into creating a Turkish cultural sphere that stretched from China to the Crimea. As the Seljuks were sitting in their new Persian home, they boarded someone new, Baghdad, the capital of the once great first Islamic caliphates, center of knowledge and trade in the Middle East, one of the greatest jewels a medieval empire could own, held by the Buyids, who had. Sorry. What is this? Do you, do people live in here? Is this kind of like a village with a village? Or is this just like a really weird maze? Cause that is cool. I'm gonna go on a limb and say it probably doesn't exist anymore. That would be really cool to look at. Hmm to be Shia Muslims, so the Sunni Abbasids gave them the permission to conquer it. This moved the Seljuks into the center of the Islamic world, and with this, they boarded yet another prize, the greatest they had seen until then, that last remaining piece of the Roman Empire in Anatolia, the Byzantines. And that prize no longer got out of their heads. Rome, one of the greatest empires of all time, the founders of European civilization, the pinnacle of what an empire could be. The Seljuks changed their imperial seal and battle banners to the double-headed eagle of Rome. They started calling themselves the inheritors and legitimate rulers of the Roman Empire and went to war, because there could in the end only be one Roman Empire. It went well at first. The Byzantines had recently declared the Armenians to be heretics to the Christian faith, so the Armenians didn't put up much of a fight when the Seljuks came to take the Byzantine Caucasian lands. From there on, they marched into Anatolia. They fought off and defeated two crusades called to defeat them. They lost Iran to a Persian uprising, but Anatolia continued to be their main prize. They came within miles of the great prize of Constantinople itself, but events that they could have never foreseen in the very place they themselves had come from, 3,000 miles away, prevented their final triumph. As in the steppes of Asia, 600 years of Turkic dominance came to an end. It took the Turkic people 600 years to migrate into Central Asia and expand from Central Asia into Persia and the Middle East and eventually into Anatolia. The Mongols only needed 40 years to conquer it all, as well as China. 
After defeat to the Mongols, the Seljuks fell apart into bickering little fiefdoms and states who all bowed to the Mongols. But far from this being the end of the story, it is merely the start of the next great chapter. Did the... Um, I, I, I forgot the name now. I'm going to call them the Nomads just because that's what sticks to mind. Did the Nom... <coughs> Excuse me. Did the Nomads... Um, now I forgot what I was going to ask. Let me go back here. Maybe this will jar my memory. Nope. Forgot what I was even trying to say. Oh! Oh! Remembered it now. Were the nomads ruled by like one person, or was it a bunch of just different um, groupings? And they just, you know, they were kind of, I don't want to say tribes, but they were kind of like families. They were just, you know, and they just collectively came together to fight together, but they, in a way, were individual. When you have the mongrels, and I mean, that was Khan. Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan. I don't know how the correct pronunciation is I want to do a video on him so if anybody knows any good videos unless I've already done one on him and I forgot which is very possible um, I, I, I'm, I'm asking this uh, simply to kind of defend you know the mongrels 40 year reign to, to conquer and they did not as much it's easier to be ruled under one person who has that extreme authoritarian rule as opposed to a collective, you know, a, uh, yeah, you get it, a collect, a, a group of heads who will yay or nay as to what the next step's going to be. So if they had something like that, then yeah, they're not going to be able to do what the mongrels would want to do, which is whatever Genghis Genghis Khan wanted to do. It's okay yeah we're gonna go over here we're gonna walk 15 feet and then just stop all right a little different one you have other sides saying well i don't want to walk 15 i, I want to walk six i want to walk four over this way you know what i mean it's so i'm just kind of defending them in a roundabout way of forgetting what it was that i was trying to say to begin with i apologize I should be hit in the face with a crowbar from time to time. A didgeridoo? Is that what that was? Over the centuries, from 600 to 1200, the Turkic expansion created a vast Turkic cultural sphere of many a Turkic people. It stretched from Siberia to Anatolia, and as the Mongols emerged from the vast horde lands of the East, their conquest of Asia didn't just result in a mere subjugation of Turkic tribes and kingdoms, but in massive migration of Turkic peoples. From Central Asia to Persia and the Caucasus, many Turkic peoples packed and fled in search of refuge, and they mostly ended up in the lands of the Seljuks thereby establishing a large Turkish population in Anatolia. The Seljuks themselves fell to the Mongols, and the 1300s were dominated by the Taifas, little petty kingdoms, warlords, and tribes that bickered and fought amongst themselves for control over the others and dominance. But they had a great advantage compared to the others defeated by the Mongols, the Zagros mountain range. Stretching from the Caucasus to the Gulf, this vast range of mountains protects whoever rules Iran, but it also locks them into Iran, making it hard to sally forth into the Middle East or Anatolia. And at a certain point, it was simply no longer worthwhile to launch large expeditions to ensure the Anatolian Turks stayed in line. The most powerful of them was the Rum Sultanate, the successors to the Seljuk throne. One of the least powerful was a little state whose rulers originally came from Central Asia and had fled west from the Mongols, the Ottomans. While much of the Middle East had been flung into chaos through the Mongol invasion, the Ottomans managed to build a sphere of stability in their realm. This attracted craftsmen, intellectuals and trade, while also providing the Ottomans with the stability required to go out and hassle others. 
those others, mainly being the Byzantines. But the Ottomans didn't just go charge into war as the Seljuks had. And of course, they went through spats of conquest here and then. But the Ottomans mainly subdued the Byzantines through diplomacy, politics and patience. They married Byzantine princesses, schemed within the politics of the Byzantine royal court, promised the Byzantine support against the Bulgars, Venetians and Serbs, but used those promises to just take lands previously owned by the Byzantines, then conquered by others, and to not give them back. By the turn of the century, the Ottomans had established a firm grip over the Balkans and Western Anatolia, and that gave them an enormous strategic advantage over the other Caliphates and the Seljuks and everyone else who had come before them from the Middle East and Iran and attempted to conquer the Mediterranean. Access to the resources of these lands would further Ottoman conquest for more power elsewhere. It gave them a place of some tranquility as the Mongol hordes invaded Anatolia again. But to understand the complete significance, we have to look at maps and ships. Seafaring was extremely dangerous for most of human history and mostly involved coast hopping. You would sail along the coastline, always in sight of said coastline, and at all costs avoid the open ocean as much as you possibly could. The means to navigate the vast open seas were simply not available, and getting lost out of sight of the coast was tantamount to a death sentence. This, of course, cancelled out most of the Atlantic as any means of transportation by sea, but transport by sea was still faster and more efficient than transport by land, so it was still worth the risk heading out and hopping along the coastline. The Mediterranean, however, was different. It was mostly calm, but far more important, it had peninsulas, lots of peninsulas, all over the place. And when you look at these maps, it is also useful to forget the current geopolitical boundaries and borders. A thousand years ago, the concept of Europe as a uniform entity of some shared culture or values would have made no sense. What, however, would have made sense would have been to categorize the region around the Mediterranean as its own entity, a kind of Mediterranean sphere of culture and influence. People in the Levant would have had more interactions with people in Sicily than people in Sicily would have had with people from the North Sea. Add to that the Egyptian breadbasket and you have a region that many empires came to try and rule for themselves. Especially in these regions, the Adriatic, the Aegean, oh. the Black Sea and in particular the Dardanelles. In these waters it is close to impossible to get lost at sea. Almost like lakes, no matter where you head, you will almost certainly, at some point, hit land in close vicinity. This means that you didn't need to hop along the coastline as much and that you could tax, police and control all traffic going through these segments of ocean. This allowed for specialization in nautical transport and warfare, and consequently it should not surprise you that prior to the 16th century, most European and Middle Eastern empires happened to be those who controlled those straits. This yeah. is a great springboard to go out and conquer the rest of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And what about the Mediterranean? What makes it so special? It is again the fact that ocean travel was limited to coast hopping. To the people of the time, the oceans were vast, deep, pits of certain death. Siberia was empty horde lands with close to no means of large-scale transportation. So if you owned the eastern Mediterranean, you controlled all trade between west and east, be it the spices from India or silk from China. All of it had to go through the eastern Mediterranean. And if you controlled that, you could tax it. Before the 17th century, uh, this is going to be a, just a 10 minute video. Just, I just want to get caught up to where I should be. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um, it's been good so far. But, you know, I'm, I'm learning more. And, uh, you know, I did. I, I always wondered why this was such an important thing to conquer. Because it, it's not big. It's mostly water. Man, that makes so much sense. You control all this land. You control all the imports. Somebody wants to come in and you know go along here. That's yours. They got to go some way around and then put it on land and try to walk. I mean, they're gonna pay a duty or just risk losing a lot of stuff. Like, nah, this is ours now. We're keeping this. So. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and end this here, leave you a nice phrase you can use, and that is, a duck does not make a good baseball bat. And there you go, video's over.